get your Bibles out. Let's raise the Word of God high and say this with me. This is my Bible, God's holy Word. I will make it a lamp into my feet and a light into my path and hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, as we open your word, you've promised us that though heaven and earth will pass away, your word will not. So Father, may we know that even here on this earth, we speak something that's eternal. May we in this moment know that you want to speak of something new to us and have our ears opened to hear and our eyes open to see. I pray in this moment that you will speak to each heart and each mind, each person, as if it were just an audience of one right now. I pray as we open your word, it will be honored, it will be exalted, as if you were in this very room yourself speaking it to us. Lord, have your way now. May we be in your hands. May you make us and mold us to the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to be continuing on, like I said, throughout the summer, dealing with how do you prepare the way of the Lord in your life, in our community, in your work, in our church. And uh, this week we're going to discover a concept called a regenesis. We don't use that word a lot, but I'm going to just explain what regenesis means to you. Uh, all those re-words, the renewal, the revival, those are words we're used to hearing in church, renewal and revival. And they get watered down a lot. But if you never speak of revival or renewal, I guarantee you one thing will never happen. Renewal or revival. I, I've said over and over again to some of you that revival must begin with you. It's something only God can do, but if you're not ready for it, and if you're not preparing for it, you will either miss it or it just will never happen. So I want to encourage us in this room that we need to start expecting that God wants us to live in a place where he's constantly doing new things. He's constantly making us new. He's constantly working in our life in a way that makes us better. Because if you are not living your life that way, and if we're not living our way as a church, then what we're saying is we've already arrived. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm confessing, I'm going to confess sin today. I've not arrived. I'm not the man that God wants me to be. And I bet you're not the woman or the man that God wants you to be ultimately either. Until I'm face to face with Jesus, he's not done with me. And he's not done with you. So we are constantly in a point where we should say, I constantly want to be more like Jesus. Which means we have to be constantly in a place where you want God to do something new in you, to renew you, to change you, to transform you. All right, that is the Christian life. In essence, that's it. So if we're not doing that, we're missing something. If we think that we all have arrived or that we're perfect like we are, that we have it all together, I would say we become like a Pharisee. Because that's what the Pharisees thought. So next week, we're going to start talking about the woes of the Pharisees. That we don't get trapped in doing the things God says we shouldn't do, because if you're doing the things that God says you shouldn't do, you're not going to be renewed either. But today, what I wanted to say is that we let God do a supernatural work in our hearts called a regenesis, preparing for a revival. So what is a genesis, first of all? It is something that is original, you know, like KFC, right? The original recipe, right? Finger looking good. We see some, do you know, a lot of those like commercials like that, they don't make them anymore, you know that? Those little slogans. Somebody tell me a commercial you can remember from a kid. A slogan. Have it your way. How about a Kit Kat? Give me a break. They don't do that anymore. But there are some, some original ideas. God likes to do original things. And a Genesis, if we go back there, and we are in just a moment to Genesis chapter 1, was the original how he created to be. And you'll see over and over again, God would say something, and something was good. Now, what God is constantly doing, because we messed it up, we broke the covenant, we broke the contract, Adam and Eve messed it up for us, but now we're responsible because we too have now a sin nature, and because we've messed everything up, God is constantly in a process of renewing or doing what's called a regenesis. What he wants to do is take our lives and do something new that's just as good as the original and moving us in a direction that's going to establish us to look good with God. He wants a new beginning, a fresh start. Anybody in here need a fresh start? 
Anybody messed up this week and you go, man, I shoved my foot in my mouth. You talkers like me out there, come on, you do that all the time maybe? You go back and say, I can't believe I said that to that person. You know, maybe you didn't think anything at the time, but you go back and you think about what you said and you go, <gasps> maybe, maybe you didn't do something you know you should have done. Or maybe you did something you know you shouldn't have done. We all need a fresh start. We all need a new beginning. Isn't that great that God is a new beginning God? He, he is in this, in this thing of regenesis. He wants to make something original again, but new. He wants to recreate something just as if it were new. He wants to bring life into existence again in your life. We have scriptures like Ezekiel where he brings dry bones and gives them life again. God doesn't want you dead. That's why the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of what? Salvation comes through Christ Jesus, which is what? Eternal life. Christ is always intending, God is always intended to give us life. Jesus says in John 10, 10, that I have come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. God wants us to live in a place where he's constantly bringing life into us, creating us anew. So let's go back to Genesis 1, 1. Let's look at where God did the original thing. And in there it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on and says that the earth was void and null. It had nothing. In other words, God took something, ex nihilo. He took something that was nothing and he made something. The evolutionists got it wrong. The evolutionists think that there was nothing and we just came to be. What God says is there was nothing and he spoke and it came to be. Now you can believe what you want to believe. I'm going to believe the latter one I just said. I do not believe in an instance that out of nothing came us and there was nothing behind it. There was no design. There was no creator. But in the beginning, it says here that God created the heavens and the earth and he started to doing it out of nothing. Ex nihilo. We believe that as Christians. If you're in here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe that there is a creator. If you don't believe that, see me in my office afterwards. We'll have a new creation talk. So God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, verse 3, then go down to verse 6, and God said, and then verse 9, and God said, and verse 11, and God said, and verse 14, and God said, and God 20, and God said, and verse 24, and God said, and then verse 26, then God said. Are y'all getting a, a pattern here? God likes to create by what? Speaking. That's why he gave us the word of God. So that it can constantly speak to our lives to create a new in us. Now if we look at this text and he goes through and he does everything and he creates everything. It says then in verse 20, 25, at the end of that verse it says, And God saw that it was good. But God wasn't done speaking. Because then it says that God went on in Genesis and he then created us. He created, let us make man in our image and our likeness, verse 26. So then in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you want to know how mankind came to existence, right there it is. He spoke it. He created it. He made everything that would ever be. But there's one difference between what happened up above verse 26 and what happened below 27. It says in verse 28, and God blessed them. And then if you, I gotta turn the page in mind. And then in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. He didn't say that until he created who? Us. Male and female in the image of God. And he did it all, I love this, he just spoke it into existence. Isn't that amazing? There's no one that's that powerful but God. That he made something out of nothing. And God, listen, I am nothing and God's done something with me too. And then just in case you didn't know that, big smarty pants out there, you are nothing either but God can do something with you. Amen. And how does he do it? When he speaks into your life when he starts to create a new in your life, when he starts to take something that's messed up and he says, don't worry, I got this, I'll forgive you. Or maybe you go out there and listen, some of you, 
Like we had a big accomplishments today, right? We had some big smarty pants standing up here, right? Right? Big, big, big accomplishments. But God's not done with them yet either. Just because you get your master's degree or some of you with your PhD or your doctorate, God's not done with you ever. You've never fully arrived. He wants to continue to speak into your life. Every single one of us. I know all you high schoolers, you think you're done once you graduate. Amen? It's, it's not. All you guys that are out there in real life, you know that, right? It's just the beginning. Just the beginning of something new that God wants to do in you. So God did all these things creating in the beginning, and he said it was very good. Now, God could have been done, but we sinned. So then this is the God we have. Our God says, okay, you've messed it up. And over and over again throughout, from Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, and we're going to go to Revelation 21 in here just a minute in case you don't believe me, God is constantly in this process of re regenesis. How many times did you hear the prophets, if you will just return to me? Over and over again, God would return, would use his prophets to remind the people of God, return to me. Why do you think he had to do that? Because we mess up all the time. If we ever get at a point in our church where we think, uh, we're, we've arrived. You ever get in a place where you're in your life, we've arrived, and you stop saying, wait a minute, no, God, I want you to keep doing your thing to me. I want you to keep speaking to my life. I want you to keep changing me. I want you to rearrange me. When I think I got it together, I want you to rearrange it in a way that you prove that I don't. I want you to guide me on a path where I'm, I am sold out to your righteousness and your godliness. Romans chapter 6 tells us we're no longer a slave to sin, but we are a slave to God. We're a slave to his righteousness and to his holiness now. That's the journey we're on. Now, we can return to that old person. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. We can return to that old person, and, and, and listen, we can go back to where the prodigal son is eating slop with a pig. Anybody ever been there? Come on now. You walk away from God so far. But then the moment you walk back, you find God the Father right there to say, come on back in. And he's going to give you his signet ring. He's going to kill the fatted calf. And he's going to give you his cloak. And he's going to give you his sandals. And he's going to say, welcome home, son or daughter of God. God never wants you to do that. God wants to constantly be working anew in you so you don't have to settle for sin. But you can, but you can claim righteousness and holiness and godliness and be a slave to him. So let's flip over to Revelation chapter 21 for just a moment. So all in between, Jesus is talking about newness, and we're going to talk about new wine too in a, in a little bit. Yes, Baptist, we're going to talk about wine today. We're going to talk about Jesus was talking about this. The prophets were talking about this. Just return to me. Keeping this refreshing experience, this, this experience where we totally refocus on God, we rethink about God, we're just being renewed by God, we're living in a place of revival where God is constantly bringing life to us. And where he's doing it by speaking his word and breathing out upon us. And then we finally see at the end of all time, when everything's done in chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And then if you go to verse 2, and then there becomes the new Jerusalem. God is going to create everything new. But he's not just going to start and say, I'm just going to create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem after judgment. He's also going to finish everything he's begun with us in verse 3, uh, all the way down, and then go to verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne, that is Jesus, said this, Behold, I make all things new. That's you. That's me. God will not be done with us until we are fully the full new person that he's always intended us to be and we're sharing in his glory and all of eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem where there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more pain, and there'll be no more death. Isn't that a great place to be? Ultimately, that should be our focus. Everyone in this room, we see that prize. But until we get there, then what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live our lives? God tells us to live as a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. You are a new creation. If you've received Jesus Christ in your life, you became new. It says that the old has passed away and the new has come. Where do you think Jesus wants us to hang out in the old or the new? Everybody say the new. We know that. We know that's where Jesus wants us to be. 
But for some reason, we have a tendency to drift to our old person. We have a tendency to fall into those old patterns of life that always got us in trouble. Those places of regrets, those places of sin, those places where our life was not what it needed to be. But when we come into Jesus, he gives us a new opportunity. And every time we come back to him, he's going to give us a new opportunity. So, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Let's talk a little bit about this new. A lot of you have been sharing thoughts with me, and thank you. Please, if you have a praise report or something God's doing in your life or something's doing in the life of the church, I may not publish it. I won't publish your name to it, but I, did, I will continue to publish those praise reports in the Illuminator about what you're saying, what God is doing new in your life and doing new in the life of the church. And I think we need to constantly remind ourselves about that. So if you see something or something happens, please send that to me. That's a praise report to be shared either, at least with your pastor, but if not, maybe it needs to be shared with the church. But I want to share a few things that some of you said. This is when we become a new creation and we realize that God's doing something new in this place. Stuff like this happens. Somebody told me at the Tim Bray service, that, and this blew me away because this gives me Holy Ghost goosebumps. The moment I walked into the room, I could feel the presence of God. By the way, you should feel that every time we gather as a body of believers. But every now and then, there's going to be times where God blows you away. You're going to say, surely the Lord was in this place, and it was good. God was speaking to me today. It might be today for you. Everybody else could be like, that was just one of pastor's average sermons. But he might speak to you, the one person in this room that needed to hear these words today. And for you, God was here. And for you, God was speaking. And that's the power of the word of God. God may speak to you right now in this room and blow you away with his presence. Others have said this, God has brought life back to this place. Reminds me of Ezekiel. God is never done with us. No matter how dry our bones are, no matter how decrepit we may become, no matter how much the life may have been zapped out of us, God can give you new life. And God wants to do that, and he does it by breathing life into us. We will never experience revival without the Holy Spirit being free to move among us and the word of God speaking to our hearts and our minds. That's how regenesis takes place. God speaks it, and did you notice in the first part of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and the Spirit was hovering over the water. The Spirit is hovering over us as God begins to speak, and he moves freely among us. Someone else said this, we have prayed for this life to come back to this church, and it is finally here. I don't know that you believe that, and it's finally here. God is speaking, God is moving in ways that, that no one can predict. And guess what, God wants to do that everywhere, amen? God wants to start something in Lexington Park that spreads throughout all of St. Mary's County, that spreads all the way to Washington, D.C. and beyond, because God tells us to take the gospel to what? The ends of the world. We are to never settle just for what we have here. We are to, we are to say, God, no, this goes on forever. You, you have called for God's people, and he does want us to return to him and experience the fullness of his presence. If God has said that to every generation that's ever lived, why do you think he wouldn't say it to you now? Because you live in Lexington Park? Because you live in St. Mary's County and nothing good happens in either one of those places? We're beyond that, right? Amen? Amen. Because we know that's not true. That's the devil coming to steal, kill, and joy, kill, steal, and destroy. And then Jesus rebuked that right in John 10, 10. No, I've come to give life. New creations that God wants us to become. Have you embraced the new creation that you are? Something new is here. It's new in you. It's new in me. It's refreshing. It's exciting. It's real. It's a regenesis that only God can do. But the revival in the middle of revival is a word, a letter that's very, very important. Who knows what the middle word of revival is? So one time you get to be selfish. Go ahead and say, I, I. God wants you. I, I don't have this figured out. I don't know why God chose for us to be laborers in the, in the fields of harvest ready for him. I don't know why God says, I need your worship, but he wants our worship, and I, the I, you, and I are important. He don't want to do this thing without us. Could he? Absolutely. 
In fact, it tells us, if no one else will worship, the rocks will what? Cry out. God will be worshipped. God will be praised. God will be honored. And he could do it without us. He could do it with a bunch of rocks. But he chooses to do it with us because when he created us, he saw that we were very good. And God loves us so much that he wants to partner with us in this thing called life to do something new. Behold, I make all things new. So God wants to do that in you and me. Jesus had a little talk with the Pharisees in Matthew 9, 17. He starts talking about wine. He says, neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins so that both are preserved. That's Matthew 9, 17. So, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, which were the religious people of his day. And they just refused to accept him as the Messiah. And by the way, perhaps you know some friends that just, they don't want nothing to do with Jesus. They don't want nothing to do with the church. Yes, maybe you know people like that. So the Pharisees are coming to Jesus and they're just refusing it. So Jesus flips this on them and he says, look, you're wanting to drink this old wine, which is good, and it's in the old wine skins. But then you're wanting to bring this Messiah in that fits your box. That fits everything you want, and you're wanting to put them in this old wineskin. And if you put them in that old wineskin, new wine is going to burst the bag. It cannot contain who I am. You have to, therefore, take a new wineskin and put the new wine in it so that both could be preserved. So what Jesus is trying to tell them is that they need to get out of their, their, their ways that were wicked. And they're holding on to old things instead of embracing new things. So I want to talk to a couple of types of people in the room today. First is this, God doesn't want to do the same thing he did in the 50s today. God does not want to do the same thing. If you look in the scriptures, God will do similar things, but he never does the same thing over and over again. He always does it in a new way. He doesn't do away with the old. He embraces the old. The Old Testament and the New Testament, everything that God has done are there to teach us so that we can be prepared for God to do something new. But if you're in here and you long for, well, I'm okay so long as Pastor Chris don't change things too much. I've actually heard one person tell me that. Thank you, bless you, bless your heart. I've also heard people say this a few times, not bad here, so please don't, no, 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 no letters to me. Well, if we would just do that good old-time religion. God wants to do something new. And if we get stuck in the old, we're never going to experience the new. And if we start to try to stick the new in the old, it ain't going to happen. We have to be prepared for God to move in a fresh and new way here now, today, for this generation of people. We have to be doing that. Does that mean we do away with all the old? No. Don't worry. We're still going to worship the same God. But he wants us to worship with spirit and truth in a fresh way. He wants to refresh you. And if all we're doing is trying to seek the God of the past, we're never going to seek and find the God of the present. Nor are we going to provide a future for the future generation in this room. So we have to be prepared to say, God, change me. Let me give you an example. Back when ba in Baptist history, I'll never forget this, uh, when I was going through Baptist history, it was actually one of my favorite uh, seminary courses I went through. And the, and the book is written by Macbeth, not the Shakespearean. But it's about this thick. If you want to go to sleep, just come see me. I'll give it to you, okay? You can read it. It will put you to sleep. But I loved my professor. And he would talk about how he would bring history to life by saying these German Baptists that were migrating here, they couldn't speak English. But listen to what these... They were, they were losing their young people. They were leaving the church and choosing English churches instead of going to church with their grandparents and great-grandparents and their parents. And so this one little old lady, and I can't remember her name, but if you want to read Macbeth, you can go find her. Um, she stood up and she, she basically called her whole church to say, look, I will come, and she's speaking in German, I will come to church where there's English because I want my children to worship with me. This one little old lady started to say, I will let the old go so that new can come. She sacrificed herself so that she could experience and her children can experience the worship of God. People in here, we need to be prepared to do that. 
Now, there's another group of people I want to talk to, just like Jesus would have been talking to about that day. Holding on to Judaism, not letting go, refusing to accept the Messiah because he didn't meet their expectations. And here's this next group that's in here, the young generation I want to talk to. They get upset when the old people don't move fast enough. You know what I'm talking about? Come on. That's right. All right. And there's, there's also a group in there that's like, man, you know the music we sang? It's from the 90s. Come on. Really? I mean, who cares? We breathe the freshness into it, right? Or maybe we start to say, you know, you, you, what's going on is not good enough for you, so you miss it. And then by the time, it's the same way the, the people holding on to the old time religion mission miss what God's doing new. Then the people over here that, that are wanting more, they totally miss that God's already moving here. And you just, he just didn't meet your expectations. Isn't that what both sides do? Come on now, yes. When Jesus doesn't meet our expectations because we're expecting something else like we know better than he does. That's like putting new wine in old wineskins. Whatever side you're on, what we need to do is come together, all generations, all peoples, and worship God. Will we please stop, and I'm not saying this is on here, I'm talking to, to, to the church at large here. You can tell this to your friends. Will we stop segregating ourselves by age or by race and we will just worship the one true God? Whether we sing, amen, whether we sing rap song or we sing a hymn, I could care less. And if you let Samuel lead worship, it's going to be screamo worship. And he's been talking to me. Do you think Ben could do this? I don't think Ben can do that, but that's okay. If you don't know what screamo is, you're not missing much. But I listen to it because my son listens to it. And I tolerate it. In the mornings. <laughs> but then I also can tolerate orchestra music and guitars and piano and organs and every type of music that God gifts us with. We are to worship him. If you go to Psalm 150, he gives us a list of ways to worship him with all kinds of instruments. But the one that's constant is what? Your voice praising him. Because there's power in spoken words. God spoke life. He wants you to speak life. I want you to get the connection. Just as God spoke life and wants to speak life into you now, he wants you to speak life with what you say and what you do with your life because he created you to be a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. And in Revelation, behold, all things I make new. So in this room, I want us to have a regenesis. I want us to say, God, no matter what, we're here every week to be refreshed. We're here every week to be renewed. We're here every week to seek revival. We're here every week to pray for these things. We're here actually constantly seeking those things. And so when you come into this place, I know people ask me, Pastor, when you do an altar call, do you really mean everyone? And everybody should by now realize, what do I mean? Everyone. Altar calls just not for people that are lost. The altar calls for people that need to be rebirthed and renewed. And that's all of us. And anything that God's doing in our life that we need to respond to him to be that new creation. A regenesis is the work that God does in you to recreate you. He's working in me. He's working in you. God wants to speak anew. So I have a few questions we're going to end on. When is the last time you came not expecting what you want? Maybe you open the, the bulletin today and say, there's only one hymn in here. That's not really a hymn. God of our fathers doesn't count. Maybe you came in here and you just looked down and said, read Genesis. What's read Genesis? And you already had an attitude before I ever preached the sermon. Or maybe somebody, you know, just talk, took your seat where you're sitting right now. You know, and you're sitting in a new place because somebody else sat in your seat. So you went to the other side of the room just to, I'll show them. <laughs> you came in here with a false expectation. Instead of coming in here with this, how many of us came in here today with the expectation that God would show up? How many came in here with the expectation, God's going to do something in my life? Now watch out, you're saying amen, I'm going to lead you to this one. How many in here came in here and said, God, if there's any wicked Way in me, convict me of it today. The amen's got fewer on that one. 
How can you be transformed without God convicting you of your sin? How can we step into this room and not say, God, all of me, any impure thought, any impure way, and by the way, I've got some of those issues. I'm sure some of you do too. Maybe at my tongue, I mean, James says your tongue is like a rudder on a ship. It's little, but boy, it guides and has a lot of power to move a ship around, and it can mess your life up. Maybe you said something wrong to your child or your husband or your wife or somebody this week, or maybe your boss. Maybe, listen, we have this thing in the office, and I love it. Only Jesus can know our thoughts. There are some things, some things happen in the office that need to stay in the office. Because they're only in our thoughts. Thank Jesus. Thank you, Hallie. I appreciate that. That will forever stay, stay with me. When things happen, and it's not that we're doing anything bad. Don't think it that way. But sometimes when people come in and you go, really? And I don't say that out loud. I say it in my mind. Okay, amen? So sometimes maybe that's the same way when something happens in your life. Thank God only Jesus can know your thoughts. But think about it. If Jesus knows your thoughts, you already did it. So maybe there's something that you need God to do in your life that you need to come in here expecting a fresh encounter with God to be transformed, to be moved by the Spirit, maybe to be convicted, maybe to be motivated in Christ. Maybe you need to pray for salvation. Maybe you're in here and for the first time you've had a sense of all that you've not had in a long time about God. Do you know that he wants you to have that sense of all about him all the time? Because he is awesome. He wants you to have be in all of him to be enamored with him, not on your smartphones, not, oh, look that boy over there on the other side, looks good to all you teenagers, I know how you think. You know, I'm at Chick-fil-A someday and there's this handsome guy and we're sitting around and that guy was good looking. My daughter said, I said, yes, he was. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? That happens, right? Gets our attention. God wants our attention. God wants our focus. So that he can rebirth us and renew us and make us who he wants us to be. Do you come into this room saying, God, I want you so thick in here that I don't want to leave. That I've lost track that it's already one o'clock. How many of y'all just looked at your watch? <laughs> God, you're so, so moving. It's so thick. I know, you know, and I'll be honest, that doesn't happen often. But when it does, you know it. And there have been a times where I've been in services, I'm like, God, I don't even know how to end this worship service because you were so powerful here. Those are good moments. They don't happen all the time. But we should always be asking God to do that type of stuff, to keep us on our toes, to keep us on our feet, to keep our focus on him, to keep our desire only for him, to say, God, do something new in me. So today, here's the altar call. What's that new that God needs to do in you? I don't know. Everybody in here is different. There may be something you need to let go of. There may be somebody you need to forgive. There may be a resentment or a, a bitterness. I, I run into people all the time, and I, I've already told you this. I, run in, I ran into somebody this week, and they told me they left the church. You know, they used to come to Lexington Park a long time ago, and I always tell them, you left too soon. I don't care what kind of pain you went through or what kind of hurt you went through or what you got upset about. You got to hang in there. Imagine if God's people, when things got bad, how many bad kings they had in the Bible. Imagine if they just said, I give up on you, God. Give up on your sanctuary. Give up on your temple. I'm out of here. They had to keep going so that a Josiah would come and it would restore the temple. They had to keep going so that God could do new things. When somebody came and fully was obedient, and it has nothing to do with Pastor Chris, it has to do with us. When God's people to come together in obedience, God does something great. And when we say, God, I'm ready to change. I'm ready to be made new. I'm ready to see something, you do something great that only you can do. I want that in my life. Amen? When we get to that desperate moment, God shows up. And we want to stay there to where all we do is desire him. So what is it that God needs to do in you that's new today? For some of you, you're not saved. For some of you, you've never given your, you've not really surrendered your life to Jesus. Now, Billy Graham says up to 80% of the people in the pews are not saved. I don't know if that's true in here or not. But I'm not a fool. I know somebody in here is not saved. So if you're in here today 
and you're just here and I'm glad you're here and you're just going through the motions and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you don't really know what that means, you have the head knowledge but you've never let it transform your life, then the new that God wants to do in you is to rebirth you. If you're in here today and you're a Christian and you're going through the motions and you've lost that all for God and you've lost that refreshness that he comes and you're just kind of like, I'm here because my family comes here. Or I'm here because my wife told me I had to come to church. Or I'm here because my parents drug me out of bed. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why you may be here. And maybe you have come here because you like church. You want to be a good person. There's nothing wrong with that. But is your life transformed? Are you afraid to say, God, you're not done with me. I want you to complete the work you've begun in me. And I want you to continue to renew me. And I want to be a part of a church that's being renewed and regenistized then that's for you. That's for you because revival begins with you. Regenesis begins for you saying, I'm listening God speak. I want to hear your voice clear and I want to see you do something awesome because you're an awesome God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just like you spoke in the beginning, I ask you to speak today. As you spoke, people's lives were changed. As you spoke, the earth came into existence. As you spoke, all of creation came into be and praised your name, ultimately by you creating us. And here we are today, thousands of years later, worshiping you as the God who created all. And we're asking you to create anew in us. We're asking you to, to do what you've promised, to behold all things are made new. May you begin that in us now. Lord, may you begin that in our church. May you continue to do that in our lives, in our homes, in our marriages. May you continue to do that in our Sunday school classes. May you do it in our work. Yes, God, even our work, even over here on Pax River, even here on the base. God, do something new. Do something new in our government. Do something new in St. Mary's County. Do something new in Washington, D.C. God, do something that only you can do. But let it begin right here, right now with us. In this moment, Lord, may we draw close to you. May we seek you with a heart that says, Lord, let the old be gone and the new come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.